New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Amazon, and Publishers Weekly best-selling author, co-writer with Stephen King of the best-selling novella Gwendy's Button Box, and most recently, Gwendy's Final Task, founder and publisher of Cemetery Dance Magazine and Cemetery Dance Publications Bookprint. These are just a few of the many accomplishments I can list about my guest today. But rather than just listening to me tell it all, let's hear it from the man himself. I'm so incredibly honored to have Mr. Richard Chismar here today. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for agreeing to see me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. So... Of course, I know um, you're the owner and founder of Cemetery Dance Magazine and the book publication. What made you decide to go that route? What made you decide that was what you wanted to do? Um, you know what? I was in college at the time. I was in my final year at the University of Maryland, and I uh, was selling short stories to uh, various small press magazines and and feeling very grateful that I was doing that and, and absolutely enjoying myself. But uh what, what happened is when I would get my contributor copies, um, which is often the only payment I got, sometimes I, you know, you get a check for 10 or 20 bucks back then, but uh, this is 1988, remember? Uh, but I would get my contributor copies and I'd be all excited to uh, show my friends and then I'd pull them out of the envelope. And about half of the time, you know, the, the publication was, was, was actually really nice. So I, I could show them to my family and friends. And then the other half, they were just really am amateur, you know, productions and staples crooked and, you know, artwork that I could have done. And I'm a horrible artist that, kind of <laughs> they, you know, they kind of just went in the drawer hidden away from everybody, including my, myself. Um, so that was, that was kind of part one is I was, young. I always say this, I was young and dumb enough to think, Hey, I can do this better. Um, <laughs> And then the second thing that really, really kind of was the catalyst was when I found out that David Silva did the horror show by himself as far as design, you know, production, handling the printing, you know, locally and then shipping them all out. You know, he was the advertising department, the editorial department, the proofreading department and the uh, the shipping and marketing department. So once I found out that that someone could do that again, that was that really kind of, you know, moved me to uh, into action. And uh, those two things, yeah, I just, you know, like I said, I say it all the time. It's it's good that it happened. I was yeah. 21, um, you know, no mortgage, no family, um, and really enjoying myself. So the long hours kind of didn't really matter in the in the big picture. I was just ready to go. How did it change when you started a family, when you got married, started having kids? How did that change your perspective of your work ethic, how much you work, that sort of thing? Well, that's the interesting thing is, is it, it, um, you know, I was always accused of being a workaholic before then. And, and, and a lot of it was out of necessity. I mean, some of it was just how I was raised. I, you know, hard work was kind of the secret that, that, you know, was, was put in my head at a very early age. Um, and then job required it for sure. Um, so but then, yeah, then Billy came along and I like I wanted to go the opposite direction. I just wanted to play with the baby all day. Um, <laughs> I had, it, it was it was an adjustment and I had to find that balance all over again. Sure, of course. Definitely. Well, OK, so how did it feel when you actually sold your first magazine, when you saw your magazine out on the shelf? Yeah, you know, all those moments are, are still tucked away in the back of my head. You know, um, selling my first short story, I remember that. I remember driving home from the post office because I had a P.O. box, but it did not matter one bit. Um, and then same thing for the magazine. You know, I remember, you know, you get the first subscription order in the mail and it becomes real. You're like, wow, you know, this is because back then there was no Internet. You know, yeah. so everything was done direct mail. Um, I spent much of my 20s uh, folding flyers, stuffing them in envelopes, sealing envelopes and putting stamps on them. Um, that is, that is a true thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the first time, I think we were, we got newsstand distribution, I think with issue five, the Ricotta La special. And that was, let me see, cause we, we published two a year for a while. So I, that, that was probably right at the end of year, year two or three. Um, but yeah, I remember the first time I walked into a B Dalton and, and saw the magazine up there and you certainly, all those little things kind of, you know, they stack up on each other and just made you want, made me want to work harder and, and, and continue the dream. 
Well, when did you decide to go into actual book publishing? Because you started as just the magazine and then you started the book imprint. Yeah, we, uh, I figured out, and again, there were, there were those moments with book publishing with where I was, you know, where it, it kind of, you know, pushed me over there to do books also. The magazine business back then and now is such a crummy business as far as, you know, how it's handled returns and, you know, they don't even return the entire magazine. They would just return the ripped off cover or eventually they stopped doing that. And they just did by affidavit. So you had to completely trust these people that they really only, you know, you shipped them 3000 copies and they really only sold, you know, 450, that oh, kind wow. of thing. Um, so really early on, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, had my eye on expanding to books, but it was again, two things. I got a copy of Mark Zeezing's book of the dead limited edition and uh, borderlands press his first book. Uh, the Monteleone's uh, was uh, the magic wagon by Joe Lansdale. And I just, I loved everything about him. I love the smell, the, the, the way that they, you know, differed from the kind of books that you picked up in a bookstore for 20 bucks, you know, or $25. Um, so yeah, I kind of fell in love with with the idea of publishing books, and and we uh, we we had already it was a natural progression really because we had already established all these uh, relationships through the magazine, so it was just the next step for the books. And what I found was, you know, the profit margin was so much better on books. You know, there was so much uh, you, you know less waste. Um, a lot of the times you didn't have to deal with returns at all. And then on the flip side, it was kind of terrifying because the printing bills were significantly larger than they were for the magazine. Right. So it wasn't, but it wasn't like a difficult transition to move from one to the other for you. Um, no, I mean, in, in some ways, yeah. I mean, you know what, it was a learning curve again, because the same thing with the magazine, even though I peppered poor Dave Silva with a lot of phone calls, you know, he lived in California. I lived on the opposite coast in Maryland. So there was no hands on teaching or learning. It really was kind of flying by the seat of your pants. Um, that was back in the infancy of, uh, of like desktop publishing. Um, so yeah, we learned as we went and the same thing went for the books. You know, we didn't have, we couldn't afford, you know, cover designers and all that stuff. So the, for those first, I'm not sure how many books, at least a couple dozen, you know, that, we, that was us doing everything from the typesetting to the proofreading, to the designing, the covers, the, and the dust jacket flaps, everything. Um, wow. You know, so yeah, it was just, just, it was just, everything was heightened because like I said, the, the risk was higher with the printing bill and, and everything. I mean, it, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I made in the beginning was paying too much for art, but I can't, I wanted to keep with what was the industry standard. So for a lot of those early books, I paid, um, you know, more than I should have. And, right. uh, you know, those small things add up, you know, you're constantly, you know, trying to catch up, you're constantly behind. And so it was a, it was just, you know, a hustle all the way around. Our first 10 years were, trust me, you know, I tell people that all the time. I'm like the, the most depressing time around cemetery dance was tax time because I would figure out, I would compute my hours, all the 60, 70 hour weeks. And then I compute what we were making. And I'm even, you know, I was like, I'm making six cents an hour. But, uh, <laughs> It, you know, it was never about the money, but it was, it's it still, you were worn out and you were, you were constantly hustling and then you would look at the return. And, but I loved what I was doing and, and we just kind of powered through that and, and got to the point where the books were more successful. And, you know, the magazine's never been a big, you know, financial plus. It's just always kind of been done out of love. Yeah. Well, I personally like the magazine. <laughs> I, I need it back in my life. So that's something we're going to focus on once we uh, can catch up with a few of the books and, uh, you know, kind of add, add a little bit more staff, too. Well, you've had a lot going on lately, especially with your most recent release, the Gwendy's Final Task. Yeah, yeah. This is the busiest time it's been. Um, I mean, we've, we've had big productions before when he's button box, uh, Stephen King's blockade, Billy, you know, where it's, it's more than just a limited edition where we're servicing bookstores all over the country. And, and uh, you know, it's a legitimate bestseller, that kind of thing. But this has been the, the biggest one and partially is, is, you know, it's the biggest first print run. We did a hundred thousand copies. We've, we've never done that right out of the gate. And then the second thing is, is with all the supply chain issues um, that has been, it, I, I just told someone in an interview yesterday, it's a miracle we we didn't have to delay this book a few months, um, like so many big books from big publishers are being delayed. Yeah. Um, we really hustled and we were able to get paper at this printer from here and paper at this printer. 
Um, and our printers really busted their butts to, to get it out in time for us. It's been impressive. I've been following the process and everything. You've kept up with it as far as keeping your fans informed and showing each little step that you've been doing. I don't know how you can keep up with it all. <laughs> um, you know what? A good staff and then just a lot of work. I mean, that's the thing. And, and I've said it really early on. I said it on pub day. I'm like, hey, you know, this is a Stephen King book we're publishing. And you know, not only are, are we the publisher on the spine, but my name's on the cover because I wrote it with them. So this should be a time of just enjoyment and celebration. And I'm like, instead, it's a lot of stress. But you know what? I'm not complaining. It, it's uh, just part of the job. And, uh, you know, like Button Box was a whole lot easier. There was no COVID. There was no supply chain issues. And it was such a big surprise. And we got it. You know, we I think we announced it and published it two, two months later. And it, it was just such a cool experience. This one's been much more has to be much more businesslike. And uh, yeah, a lot of stress and a lot of, you know, fielding phone calls and emails and plugging holes and saying, you know, yes, your 1500 copies will be there, you know, tomorrow. So that kind of thing. But yeah, it's a luck, you know, I'm fortunate to have this problem. Let's put it that way. Yeah, definitely. So, well, let's talk about Wendy. When did y'all decide to just start this whole trilogy or did it even begin as a trilogy? No, absolutely was not a trilogy. It was was not even a, a thought of a book or anything. It was just literally a, a short story that Steve couldn't finish. Um, we were talking about collaborations one day via email and, and he, uh, you know, he mentioned it and I was like, oh, I'd love to read it. And he showed up the next day and he, and he kind of just said, do with it as you wish. And I, you know, I said, you want me to try to finish it? And he's like, yeah, if you think you can. So that's, that's literally how it happened. Just this offhanded exchange, um, and then I sat down right away and added a bunch and sent it to him. And he added some and sent it back. And then we kind of both worked on the ending together. But believe it or not, when we were finished, you know, we kind of decided, all right, this is this is great. We really enjoyed this. What are we going to do with it now? Um, so the only reason we ended up publishing it as a little hardcover was uh, because we had done a, a similar length story. Actually, it was much shorter, like like nine or ten thousand were shorter. But we had done Blockade Billy from King as a, uh, as a little standalone hardcover. And it was a lot of fun and we both enjoyed it and it sold a lot of copies. Um, so yeah, we decided let's, let's do it as a little hardcover modeled after that. Um, and then just didn't, you know, we released it. It was exciting. It was fun. And we, we didn't really give any thought to how popular it would be. I, I, I didn't even think about the bestseller list and stuff. I remember I, I picked up a copy of USA Today for some reason and on the, right on the front page, right below the flap, this was a week after publication. It said, you know, the nation's top selling books and it had the top five and a, and a jump to an inside page um, for the complete list. And Gwendy's button box was number five. And I just remember thinking, oh, my gosh. And then, you know, I found out it was on The New York Times and that was it. We never had plans for it to turn into anything other than this, just the short story that kind of grew on us. So it was it was just a cool experience from start to finish. So but then you continued with magic feather what made you decide to do that um you know what again the same thing it's it's uh people, i guess people could say you know steve and i despite the fact that we we communicate you know pretty much daily in some in some form um we, we need to work on our communication skills because with the second one all i did is i woke up one morning um i remember i had, I had seen a a news story the night before about the uh about the new members of congress and, and how uh you know, how much of a, of a, you know, how it had a lot of, you know, minorities and females, and it was just a very, you know, eclectic group of people. And, and people were excited about this as, as I was. And, and I just remember I woke up the next morning and I, and I emailed Steve very early, which I don't usually do. And I said, I, I think I know what gwendy has been doing since the first book. I think she's a newly, a newly elected member of Congress and the button box shows up in her office one day. And Steve loved the idea. He wrote me right back, said, uh, you know, I'm going to be busy with Holly Gibney for the foreseeable future. I don't know which book it was. Um, and he said, but you, you need to write this. So, again, I've told this story before, but I took that as, you know, Rich, you write the first draft because we collaborated on the first book, you know. So mm -hmm. I took that as you write the first draft and because I'm busy. And when you're finished, send it to me. And when I have time, I'll, you know, I'll do my thing. And uh, but that's not what he meant. He just meant you go ahead and handle this one because I sent him the finished manuscript and he's like, no, this is this is good. This is your story. And he said, if you want me to do a quick edit, I will. And otherwise, 
you know, roll with it. So I, I've, I've told many people I, I never would have had the courage to go back to Castle Rock and expand the story and, you know, bring back old characters from the Stephen King universe and do all that if I knew that he wasn't going to piggyback on, you know, the manuscript. I, I, it would have been a completely different story. But then you did, though, or he did, actually, when y'all did Gwendy's Final Task. I just recently finished it actually two days ago okay and the way y'all finished the story was amazing i mean it was emotional yeah it was emotional for us too i mean i you know i i i you know texted him at some point towards the end and said yeah I, you know i shed a few tears but yeah the third book was steve's idea which which makes it even more special he he i got some i got a bunch of texts one sunday evening um last summer and uh he, he just you know he said what if this and what if that and and we just rolled with it from there we i said you want to write it together and he said yeah like you know can you block some time and you know i think he said in september and we ended up starting early in august and we just went back and forth on a much bigger scale than the first one and um and had a blast and uh so yeah we uh you know the, the fact that it was steve's idea this time like i said it made it even more special for me what are the chances you think that Gwendy might be turned into a movie? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's with uh, it's with a really good crew right now. Um, I can't say much about it, but I know, you know, they're, they're being very active on it. Um, you know, I got an email about that last week. So hopefully, you know, whether it's a movie or whether it's like a limited series or, you know, something like that, it's, uh, you know, so many of Steve's stories have been adapted and are in production. So I'd be shocked if it wasn't. Um, it's just a matter of when. That brings me to this. I personally, I've read your bio, and of course I've seen where you've got screenwriter listed, and thus and such, but I had no idea some of the movies that you actually co-wrote the screenplays to, like Roadhouse 2 or The Washingtonians. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, that that was, again, one of those kind of just happy accident, you know, things where the opportunity presented itself. And I, I grew up with, with John Sheck, who was my production partner and writing partner. Um, for the film stuff. And uh, he went on to Hollywood and became, you know, a big star. He was on the front of Vanity Fair and he uh, started that thing you do with Tom Hanks and Hush with Gwyneth Paltrow and all these big movies. And, and we kind of lost touch. And then at some point he was home um, visiting his parents who still live here. Um, and I saw him out jogging one day. So I pulled over and we talked for a while and then that put us back in touch. And we said, we should do something together. Cause we, you know, we're both kind of in the same entertainment type business. And so we started, you know, he wanted to, to make a short film of a story of mine called Heroes. Um, and that's what started it. It, it uh, He did a, he directed and starred in this little short. Um, he got Jaiman Hansu, who was in Gladiator and Amistad and just a fantastic actor. And uh, we did this little production in Los Angeles over the course of a couple of days. Um, and then that led to other opportunities. We actually, you know, the biggest projects we worked on never got made, unfortunately. We, uh, we adapted from a Buick 8 um from from steve and we had great people attached to it and we got close to being a go several times but this was this was when hollywood was a little cooler on stephen king um you know before he got hot again um so yeah we had some problems getting that done and then we did uh black house for akiva goldsman um and and just ha had a ball doing that i mean it was a difficult book to adapt but we we kind of just loved the challenge and, and had a, a great time doing that and akiva loved it and then it got caught up in all the red tape with uh dreamworks and steven spielberg and the talisman because they had the rights and you know so yeah but both of those are, are regrets but lot lots of other cool opportunities mick garris asked us to do you know the washingtonians for uh masters of horror and then he had a series called fear itself on like NBC or something. We did two episodes of that. Um, we did the poker club by Ed Gorman. And so, yeah, we had, you know, and Roadhouse too, I can't leave that out. That was the first thing we did after Heroes. And what's funny is they, John had already accepted uh, the lead role and they needed work done on the script. And I remember John came to me and he said, it's like a 10 day job. We'll get paid X amount of money. It's a great opportunity. And, and I just remember saying, yeah, but it's Roadhouse too. you know, nothing against it. The first one's a classic. I said, but it's not really in our genre or what we want to be known for. And he said, this is a rewrite job. Our, our names will not be on the script, you know, but we'll make a good paycheck. So I still remember writing that sitting by my sister's pool for a week 
And then sure enough, we, we rewrote so much of the script that they put our names on it. So <laughs> it's, it's funny. I've, I've only signed one DVD of uh, all the signings I've done. I've only signed one DVD of Roadhouse 2, but it does come up quite often now. <laughs> Okay, well, out of all of your books that you've actually wrote, not necessarily the co-wrote, right? your books, which one would you say would be like, well, I guess your favorite that you took the time to write yourself? Um, probably the last one, probably Chasing the Boogeyman, um, because it's, uh, you know, it's such a personal story. And so much of it is drawn from, you know, my memories and, and they're very accurate. And, and, you know, having the having the opportunity to write about my parents and, and my siblings and my best friends growing up in Edgewood, Maryland, um, I, you know, I didn't think I'd ever really have that, you know, other than maybe if I wrote a journal or something that, that no one else would, would see or read. Um, but because of the idea came along to do this, this book in a tr true crime format, um, yeah, it was just that way. I, I tell everyone it was a pleasure to write, despite the fact that it's about a serial killer. Um, and it almost felt, you know, sometimes a little self-indulgent, you know, because I was writing about, you know, my own history and, and, and the stories from our childhood that when we get together with old friends, we, you know, constantly talk about. And I, I finally got to put them in print for everyone else to read. And uh, yeah, so that's probably my favorite um, of my own stuff, and then you know the collaborations with with Steve and my son and some other guys, some other folks have, have been fun too. When did Billy first ask you to write with him, or did he come to you, or did you go to him? Uh, I went to him. You know, I went to him and just said, "Hey, it'd be fun if we did this together," because he was, you know, he had sold I think his first short story when he was still in high school. Um, and then some essays and things like that, that he kind of pulled double duty on. He was smart. You know, he wrote them for class. And then I was like, you know, you could probably sell those to a different like Stephen King related, you know, books. Um, so he, he was fortunate enough to be able to do that. And then at some point we just we said, we're going to we should write this together, write this. And uh, the same editor who he sold his first short story to asked me to write a, a, a horror story based on the sea. Um, or the ocean or sea going, you know, and, and I knew everyone was going to do cool things about sea monsters and haunted ships and things like that. So I immediately said, you know what, I'm going to do a haunted lighthouse because it's connected, but at the same time, maybe it'll be a little different. And, and that's when I asked Billy, I said, we should do the short story together. And we did and had a blast. And then about a month, he was at school in Maine. He was up at college and, and probably about a month after it was published, I, I remember I texted him and I said, you know, I don't think we're done yet. And he said, I've been thinking the same thing. So that's when we expanded it to uh, to novella length and, and published it as a as the book, and then turned it into a movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had we had several people interested in in a film version, and we ended up going with Greg Lamerson just because uh, I really appreciate you know Greg's work ethic and and uh, you know we had wanted to do something together for a while, so we just kind of handed it to him and said, do with it. You know, kind of like Steve said to me, do with it as you wish, and and uh, you know he. he He's like, are you sure you don't want to write the script with me? And I was like, no, you know, if you're going to direct it, you write the script, you do all that, you know, yourself and, uh, you know, we'll move on to other things. But yeah, we, yeah. I mean, I remember telling Billy, you know, you're you're in college still and you're on a movie set for something that you wrote, which is pretty darn cool. It's impressive. It really is. Yeah, we had fun. So, so OK, I've asked this to indie authors before, but you're actually you have a publication yourself. So what would you say is the biggest difference between self-publishing versus sending your work out to a publication? Um, you know what? It, it's, it's, I think it's just the obvious, you know, the amount of control that you have is, is the big difference. Um, you're the boss, you know, you get to decide everything if you're truly self-publishing it. Um, and then the, the positives and negatives that come with that. If, if you're good at your job, Actually, if you're good at various jobs, then it's it's a great positive in your corner. You know, you get you put together a great cover, you put together great cover design, you put together great promotional copy for the back cover, um, all of that. You know, professional proofreading, and you know, of course, a, a strong story. Um, unfortunately, if you're only good at you know, you have a strong story, but you have a crummy eye for artwork and 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 cover design and and the flap copy is horrible then you know all those things are going to contribute to fewer and fewer people reading it you know right. and, and and in some ways yeah you face an uphill battle because it's, it's there's still a stigma attached to self-publishing um 
But, you know, to me, I've always it's just like Billy started a Patreon page. And I'm like, you know what? Anytime you can have the control over your work and still, you know, be able to build, be, be able to build something, whether it's a readership or what or, or whatever. Um, that's exciting to me because it, it, you know, reminds me of how I started the, you know, Cemetery Dance itself. And, uh, you know, there's no rules to follow. You kind of have got to feel your way out. And um, and again, I, I think that scares a lot of people, but I have that entrepreneur kind of bug in me. So to me, it's exciting. And that that's me, you know, the idea that you can self-publish your own work and learn while you go. Um, so each subsequent publication gets better and better. That That's exciting to me. Well, you look, whatever you, um, actually, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. You usually do limited editions, numbered editions, you know, reprint, so to speak. But do you actually yourself have people send in short stories or ideas or anything like that to you to try um, to have printed? Uh, you know what? I mean, in the old days, uh, you know, we, we got 500 plus submissions a month for the magazine alone. Oh, wow. um, you know, and that that's one of the reasons why we, we had to stop being open, you know, to the public yeah. for, for stories. And we still open. We still try to open every uh, summer for like, uh, I think it's anywhere from two to three weeks um, and we get flooded, but that's fine. Uh, but we just couldn't handle it anymore. You know, it, it was taking away from production time and everything else. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, and, and we have books submitted to us all the time. I mean, right now we're in a, we're in a position um you know, we were in a position beforehand, don't get me wrong, but especially with COVID and all the supply chain issues, you know, where we're, we just need to catch up. So I'm, I'm not really buying a lot of new stuff, but, you know, Kevin Lucia, I, can't, I can never pronounce Kevin's last name, Lucia. Um, <laughs> he's in charge of the, you know, the ebook and the paperback line now. So he's been doing really well and he's still acquiring new stuff. Um, and that's easier, you know, it's, it's print yeah. on demand and it's, it's ebook production. So it's, it's not, you know, you're not having to send it to a hardcover printer and, and, you know, just for an example, you know, we could usually turn around a hardcover book at our printer anywhere from, you know, 60 days to 90 days in, in the past. You know, now it's taken up to six and seven months to get a book turned around. And uh, so, yeah, it's a difficult time regarding production. Yeah, de well, definitely. So, OK. I'm going to go back to Gwendy. Sure. If you were to take one character from the story and maybe do a spinoff which would you choose and why it'd be the button box <laughs> the button box itself yeah it would be the button box i i you know someone someone brought that up with me the other day they're like you know you should you should do an anthology that was a terrific idea i'm like you know it's probably not going to happen but i just that would be interesting and in this third book you know we allude to uh, the other group of people who had the button box and the tragedies mm -hmm. that kind of befell them. So it'd be interesting. You know, that's, that's, uh, you know, the first book, uh, she has the button box from the time she's 12 until she graduates from college. Right. And then in the second book, I think she's in her mid thirties. So there's uh, you know, 12, 13 year gap there. I wonder what the button box was doing during that time, you know, and what it was responsible for. And then the big gap is between book two and three, you know, she's, she jumps up like 30 years almost or 25 years. So again, we hear a little snippets of what happened to the people who were, you know, the guardians of the box, but that would be the most interesting thing to me, you know, and I, and I personally, I still think there's other Gwendy stories to tell because again, there's some big gaps in her life and, and I, I love her. I love, you know, Gwendy Peterson. So I, I feel like the, she doesn't have to have the button box to be an interesting character to learn about. Um, you know, to learn more about what she's been up to. So, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if, it, if Wendy, you know, pops up again in, in Steve's own work, you know, his own solo work. I just, you know, she's, I, I think she's memorable and I think she'll stick around somehow. Oh, definitely. I think so. <laughs> so whenever you're writing, what comes first, first for you? Is it plot or characters? I mean, do you totally. develop your characters first and build around them? Mm, you know, it's a flip of a coin. Sometimes it's sometimes it's it's uh, honestly it it runs the entire range because there's been times when I've you know I've just had a piece of dialogue stuck in my head that I've then you know built a story around um, or or kind of let a story be built around you know I didn't force it I just kind of you know opened my brain a little bit more and said all right what else is there um, and then there's been times uh, 
you know, where I've had a dream and I've dreamt the last, you know, kind of like the last two minutes of running time of this story. And, and it's been, it's it stuck in my brain so strongly that I've then, you know, crafted a story to, to have it make sense. Um, but yeah, it's anything I, I've always said for me, it's like, you know, whether it's a moment in time, uh, a person, a place, um, just something that's meaningful to me. And, and that's kind of where most of the stories come from. Um, so, yeah, I don't have a formula or, or anything like that. I, I, you know, that's why it, it's sometimes hard, I think, you know, and I've done it before. I, I've helped kind of, you know, teach writing at various workshops and stuff. But it, it I, I work so much kind of by feel that it, it's sometimes it's difficult to get that across in, in a really clear way. Right. Well, before we go, I don't want to hold you up too much longer, right. but. What is one last piece of advice that you could give to up and coming writers? For the writers, it's, you know, it's the same thing that I would say with, uh, you know, because I get asked all the time about, you know, advice for publishers, too. And those are the two big questions I get and, and also advice for writers. But it's just, you know what, it's it's a lot of old fashioned stuff. It's it's uh, be, you know, understand that it's a process and it's going to take a while as anything, you know, worth, you know, anything worthy of, of achieving does. Um, so accept the fact that there's going to be a lot of speed bumps, you know, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And again, this is all old fashioned kind of cliche stuff, but it's the stuff that, you know, I've really taught my kids um, in regards to anything. And I, and I, I just, I believe in it, you know, I, I feel like it, it, it applies and uh, you know, be stubborn, be hard headed, you know, you can listen to other people's advice, but at the same time, you got to follow your own inner voice and your heart. Um, and as far as expecting those speed bumps, you know, take rejection and take those down days as kind of a, I always said, take them as a kind of badge of honor because you have to earn those things in order to, to ultimately, you know, find success and, and success is, you know, defined in different ways, you know, for different people. Some people absolutely, you know, the only success they could achieve is to have a book published and, and have tens of thousands of copies out there. Other people, you know, success is, is appearing regularly in magazines and, you know, anthologies, that kind of thing. So, and, and there's, there's no right answer. So yeah, the, you know, the biggest thing I say is just learn from your mistakes, keep grinding and understand it's not going to be easy. And uh, the best thing is I, I like the idea of, you know, kind of wearing all that rejection and stuff as, as a badge of honor, because guess what, if you're, if you're serious about it and you're really kind of trying to push yourself as, a, as an artist, that the hard days are coming no matter what. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just I, I say, hey, you know, turn those into a positive and just, you know, they're another notch on your uh, on your word processor and keep going. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I, you have no idea how much I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I, I had fun doing it and I'll come back anytime. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. You too. Take care. I want to thank Mr. Chismar again for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to speak with him and learn about his past projects and collaborating with Stephen King, which that's always exciting. But thank you all for watching, and I hope you all enjoyed today's talk and come back and see us again. I will have links to his website and Cemetery Dance Magazine listed below. Go check out his work, what he has to offer. And thank you, everybody, for joining us.